We hear God's word proclaimed in the scripture reading Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He takes me to lush pastures, he leads me to refreshing water, he restores my strength, he leads me down the right path for the sake of his reputation. Even when I must walk through the darkest valley, I fear no danger, for you are with me, your rod and your staff reassure me. You prepare a feast before me in a plain sight of my enemies. You refresh my head with oil. My cup is completely full. Surely your goodness and faithfulness will pursue me all my days. And I will live in the Lord's house for the rest of my life. Thanks be to God for his written word. for a few moments that we focus on the minister of the church, whether interim or settled minister, as being a shepherd. I feel deeply and passionately that a minister, in order to shepherd a congregation under the great shepherd, is her or himself a person who relates intimately and carefully to the congregation. <clears throat> it's really difficult or almost impossible to lead a congregation as a shepherd without an ambient relationship, meaning sharing in the fellowship hall sharing in the social times of family life, those conversations and prayers on the telephone, visiting people in their private homes, attending to the needs of a nursing home or an assisted living facility or a hospital. or a hospice facility. Wherever people find themselves, I believe passionately that relationship and preaching and listening and encouraging faith comes from that, these kind of connections. So if a pastor is not mixed up in the struggles and the stories of people, this means there's a real disconnect along the way. And to be a good shepherd is to follow the great shepherd story that we have for us in John 10. Now, in addition to being a shepherd, a pastor shepherd has other opportunities. There are at least three other role, roles in the back of my mind wherein a pastor shepherd connects with the congregation. There could be a time when the congregation needs some coaching. And coaches are in leadership positions to encourage, to guide, to train to bring forth the potential, the possibilities, and to be in this game in order for all of us to do well. Another activity for a shepherd minister is to be a consultant, to hear what the congregation would like, and to put him or herself in that position of saying, I can do this and this and this, but I need to hear from you, and therefore putting on my consultant hat from time to time, observe and evaluate and say in feedback and in love, this is what I see. 
and as a consultant before you, here are some possibilities. You might want to rethink this activity, or that tradition, or that way of being. Because I, as a consultant, well, I've been to a rodeo or two. <laughs> and then it is left to the sheep of God to decide. And thirdly, within all the activity that goes on in the, con on in the congregation, a shepherd needs to be a cheerleader to say, I've noticed, and you're doing a great job here, I've noticed how well you followed through, I noticed your creative thinking, I noticed how we could do things better here, and I believe you have the talent and skill to do it, and I've got your back, and I'm with you all the way, and I will be cheering you on, and then take the time to pat people on the back, and to notice people, and to recognize people for their strengths, their abilities, their successes, and how we are doing. So a pastor functions in all these places at different points in time, and so we look at Psalm 23 this morning, There we translate ourselves back into this ancient world, and we thoroughly enjoy this beloved pastoral imagery. This is the kind of imagery that's compelling. It is an experience that is for the day. So it is a temporary experience of David, and for all shepherds and all people who read, to enjoy the goodness of God's love, but not sliding into sentimentalities. To be a good shepherd here is to focus on a central insight in the, into the psalm that says there are at least two ideas that come out. One is God is present. The second is God is personal. So, what is God doing in your life in relation to God offering through Jesus Christ, to be the great shepherd. How is the intimacy of this psalm moving in you and through you? Well, for sure, the preacher has license in relation to this psalm to be intimate. And this intimacy does not have to do with turning the deity into a cuddly, cozy, snuggly, teddy bear kind of deity. That's not intimacy, that's schmaltz. <laughs> what are some examples? Well, we can begin with Paul. Paul again and again prayed for this born in his flesh. He longed for healing. And finally, in the second letter to the church at Corinth, he wrote about this thorn. And we don't know if it was because he had an eyesight issue, because the letters he left were written by someone else. And he would often somehow sign his signature. Or we, we, we don't know if it was because of a physical ailment that didn't give him the ability to write. But the word of God came to him and he 
finally wrote to the church at Corinth simply saying the message of God to me in the heart of hearts of my faith and spirit is my grace is sufficient for you. Until the day he died, the thorn was there. But the grace of God grew and welled up and was sufficient for him in the midst of his pains. Other experiences from the gospel include the intimacy of Jesus. Remember when he was in the company of the disciples and he went into home after home? It was the place of the host and hostess to wash the feet of the guests. And Jesus reversed that. He bends down on his knee with a towel and water and bowl and washes their feet as coming to be their servant in this intimacy. And you remember recently in the intimacy of Jesus in the upper room on Monday, Thursday, how he broke the bread the night before his death and described to them the intimacy of the next day, offering his very life in the next few hours. And it was not only in the breaking of the bread, but in the pouring out of his soul in prayer for the disciples in the early church in the Garden of Gethsemane. In his prayer, he prayed that we would, as a church, be one among other prayers. And then we remember vividly the giving of himself on the cross. How intimate does it get in his pain and sorrow crying out to God? After friends and family and three years of preaching and intimacy with people, he was completely alone and then prayed in desperation, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Beloved of God, intimacy is tough stuff. And it's up to every preacher who needs to treat it as tough stuff. So as I move on in my thoughts about Psalm 23, I recall in Mark's Gospel 16 where there is a messenger at the empty tomb saying to the people, as a trailblazer, he is going to prepare a place for you. And of course, in that dwelling place, it is ours as we look forward to the conclusion of this life and moving on to the next life. Not even only is the dwelling place being prepared, but there's a table being prepared for us in the midst of this life. So life with all its joys and sorrows and hopes and fears are addressed by God in intimacy. So as Christ promised to be with us until the end of the age, as a good shepherd, he gave his life, and we can be absolutely confident that we do not belong to the powers in this world of evil, sin, sin and death that are all around us. We belong to a God who we can be completely confident in and trustworthy because he said, I am your shepherd, the good shepherd. So just for a moment, reflect with me on 
Psalm 23, and the specific metaphors there. Quickly. Our God is our shepherd. We are the sheep, lying down in green pastures, being led beside still waters, along straight paths, being restored by rest, moving through dark valleys, relying on the rod and the staff for safety, sitting before a full meal, sitting with enemies, being anointed, watching one's cup be filled to overflowing, dwelling safely, living actually in the house of God. So I invite you just for a few moments to let your mind wander a bit. Give some free thinking, give some meditation here in the quietness of the space of your spirituality. Give meditation and thought to the Spirit of God that moves within you and warms your heart that gives you direction and peace and quietness. Move in your hearts and in your minds in powerful ways as you dwell upon these wonderful metaphors. But as I look at these metaphors, I think there are two that are primary. They are God the shepherd and God the host. And I believe shepherd and host funnel in to one element. And that element is that God is providing nurture. Nurture especially for those who are in distress. Now this means that in order to draw near to God, God is going to feed us. Being nurtured by God is to be fed by God. And it so happens that both Judaism and Christianity have recognized and celebrate the importance of divinely provided food. Just a few weeks ago, the Jews celebrated the meal of the Passover when God was intimate with them and guided them and blessed them and helped them escape from the clutches of Egypt and gave them the promised life and land before them. The Jews celebrate the meal of the Passover, enjoy the nearness of God, being fed by God. Whereas we Christians experience the table prepared for us. As mentioned in the psalm, as mentioned in just a few moments when we will enjoy Holy Communion. In front of us, in the midst of our lives, we are nurtured and fed by God Almighty. Through the life of Jesus Christ, as the scripture would describe for us, the great shepherd. 